years ago this year I left school teaching, I was teaching history, women's history, and I decided that I would start a new life for myself writing about women's history. I love the research, I love teaching, but I felt that this was going to be the time for me to do this and not, not to actually be classroom teaching, but teaching on a different scale, and I had found my topic. Uh, everyone needs a really good topic in their middle years and my fantastic topic was Maybank Anderson. I discovered her name on lots of lists of uh, educationalists, kindergarten workers, but I had no idea of the extent of, of her, her interesting life and what she'd done for women and children in Australia and indeed through the world because she was one of those global figures as I'll explain in a minute. So Maybank Anderson came to Australia as a young girl at the Rocks and she, she uh, had very basic education because women in those days did not have education. It was always the brothers, the boys who were educated. Girls were very rarely educated beyond primary school level. So Maybank somehow became a pupil teacher uh, down at Fort Street, we think. And so she was very fortunate to achieve that basic women's need, which is education, literacy, and a firm inquiring mind. Her parents were quite well educated, and obviously her, their only daughter, they wanted her to be able to earn her own living, which was exceptional in those days. So she became a pupil teacher, and that stood her in very good stead. And Maybank married uh, and would have led a very ordinary life had she not had tragedy, and the tragedy came in the form of the birth, the deaths of uh, four of her seven children in 11 years, and her husband became an alcoholic, and she then had to earn an income, three small children to bring up, and she became uh, uh, very disillusioned with the marriage, and the marriage the husband deserted and then she was on her own with her mother's help and her father's help but basically on her own as a single mother with three boys to bring up and that was the beginning of her becoming one of the first wave feminists. Maybank Anderson was unusual in that she uh, was a single mother, had three children, had to support them, didn't have a, a, a large income and she was able to see uh, the whole issue of how to survive as a woman, as a working woman. Uh, Rose Scott, not to denigrate what she did, but she never had to work. She had a very large private income. Uh, Louisa Lawson left her husband, she worked, but she didn't ever advertise the fact that she was single, whereas Maybank became an early divorcee, which took tremendous courage, and she helped win the vote for women. It's hard for us to realise today the significance of, of the vote, because we just take it for granted, but she regarded the vote as the kernel of all reform and she devoted years and years of her life to the struggle for women's suffrage. She formed the Womanhood Suffrage League of New South Wales and just battled and banged on doorways and knocked up politicians at all hours of day and night and gave them petitions and all sorts of current activist work to finally make them listen. And she evolved, she evolved the strategy which delivered the vote federally in Adelaide in 1897. Where they already had the vote, so she had it written into the federal constitution that the vote could not be taken away from women who already had the vote. Uh, and the constitutional meeting was in Adelaide. And therefore, New South Wales and the other states who had failed to give women the vote would have to follow on when we federated. So women's suffrage and federation were linked together by Maybank Anderson. I think the reason she isn't well known is that she was then Maybank Wollstonehome. So the petition was signed in the name of Maybank Wollstonehome that was presented to the federation meetings and approved. And then she married the second time in Balmain at the Congregational Church with the new century, the beginning of the 20th century. And she married the first professor of philosophy at Sydney University, Francis Anderson, and then became Maybank Anderson. So it was very interesting detective work following her career with the two names, the suffrage work 
and the work for law reform to improve divorce and uh, legal situation for women with property, inheritance of children and so forth. She did all of that either under the name of Mrs Wollstonehome or no name at all because women's names in the very beginning were not included in newspaper clippings about their meetings or their statements. Uh, sometimes she was M.W. if she wrote a poem, for instance, because she was a prolific poet, I'd have to find her as M.W. and recognise her style. And uh, yes, so the detective work was fascinating. And then she became, with the new century, Mrs. Anderson or Maybank Anderson. And through that was the work for founding kindergartens. She formed the Free Kindergarten Union because she believed that every small child no matter how poor, should have access to free preschool education. They shouldn't just start school at five. A lot of mothers had to go to work, as she did, and they should be helped by setting up these free institutions where children could be minded, looked after, uh, given meals. And so she set these up in the poorest districts like Woolloomooloo, Redfern, and the name, her name still exists in the Maybank Kindergarten in Harris Street, Ultimo. So that's about the only place in Sydney where Maybank's name is in the forefront. But her efforts uh, continued right to the end of her life. And she died at, at in her 90s. That's a long age for someone to live in those days. And she was working right up to the end as a freelance journalist or meetings of the uh, New South Wales Council of Women, uh, all sorts of organisations she was at the forefront and always writing letters to the editor or poems or short stories. And I think her major achievement was her own newspaper, which she called A Woman's Voice. She wasn't able to present suffrage, uh, some suffrage material from the platform of the Womanhood Suffrage League. For instance, she couldn't talk about birth control and she was in the 1890s, that was not done. But she was a strong believer in a woman's right to her own what they call personal independence and that was a, a code word for contraception in the 1890s. But in her own newspaper, A Woman's Voice, she could put all this sort of thing. Infanticide was a problem because of the lack of contraception and no abortion laws. So she could write about uh, what happened if women were forced to have children they couldn't afford to bring up and infanticide was a common uh, occurrence in those days. This is Maybank as an older woman toward the very end of her life and you can see what a strong and determined and beautiful face she has and such a steadfast look. That's a photo of the first copy of a woman, the woman's voice. <laughs> like to now uh, show you the books that I have uh, put out. Maybank Anderson, Sex, Suffrage and Social Reform, which is the second edition of her biography. The material that I wasn't able to put in this biography, I put in my second publication of Maybank, called after her, her uh, newspaper, A Woman's Voice, Maybank a woman's voice and I put that together and published it with my little press, Ruskin Row Press, with the help of Professor Beverly Kingston who had helped me with the first uh, Maybank book and who did Maybank Anderson's entry in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. So Bev Kingston was very happy to work on this with me and we've put together all Maybank's known documents. It has newspaper excerpts, it has speeches that she made um, to try and win the vote or to win other reforms. It has her poetry, published poetry, and songs that she wrote for kindergarten children because when she started the kindergarten movement, all the songs were about England and they were about snowdrops and snow and English blackbirds. There was nothing about kookaburras or, or Australian vegetation or Australian animals. There was just 
absolutely nothing. So she, her, one of her early books in the beginning of the 20th century was Australian Songs for Australian Children, so that the uh, the teachers in the kindergartens had songs that they could see, get the children to sing and the children to learn and games they could play that related to Australia and not to the snowdrop culture of England. Uh, so Maybank was a, an ardent nationalist in that sense and uh, although she was strictly speaking um, and very proudly of English origin and English stock she became a very proud Australian and wanted uh, Australia to be a free and independent and democratic uh, nation. So, and she was very much part of that reforming process that made Australia what they called um, the social laboratory of the world. And people came and studied Australian institutions from all over the world at the beginning of the 20th century because we were so advanced as a new young nation. And, uh, People like Maybank made it happen. Oh, this is another portrait of Maybank, one of my favourites. Um, it's her in her later middle years, with the silver hair piled up and the big, very late Victorian dress, and not smiling, but um, a powerful face nevertheless. On the, this side of the page are some of the local histories. This is a local history that she wrote. She wrote the first local history of Pittwater and the first local history of Hunters Hill, two places she was close to and she did exhaustive research in Mitchell Library going through primary documents and interviewed. Did, she was an early believer in oral history so she interviewed local residents to get their stories, the older residents to get the stories that they could tell of growing up and of their area. So again, she was a pioneer in the, in the study of local history. Why have women been left out of Australian history? It's a very good question and there was a short period when women were on the syllabus of Australian history at schools and universities, but they drift out. World War I replaced the syllabus that I was teaching in the curriculum on women's history and that's when I left teaching because the last thing I wanted to be teaching was World War I, when we'd had this wonderful era in the 70s and 80s of a curriculum that involved one half of the population's history. So I didn't leave as a statement. I left in exasperation and disappointment and, as I said, because I'd found Maybank to focus on and to become a, a thread for the next generation to learn about women's history through her because I think biography is a great way of entering an era. You can learn whether it's about the Duchess of Devonshire like in the recent film, you can learn about the condition of women historically through looking at one person and looking at that one person well. And so that's what I resolved to do. But why are women always excluded? I guess there aren't enough women in powerful positions to make the decisions about curriculum and it's a seesaw ebb and flow and we have to be strong in order to keep women in positions so that they can make curriculum decisions and they can make political decisions for half the population. Because apart from a few in, uh, rare enlightened males who need to be sought, valued, treasured, pampered and everything happened to them because they're rare and special, the work has to be done by women. It's Australian Songs for Australian Children and this poem which Dorothea McKellar copied, plagiarised and used as a basis for um, uh, my country. Maybank wrote this first. Some people thought Maybank, would have thought Maybank was was scary and aggressive person in her, from her era, but she had to be in order to get her point across. If she hadn't been, uh, those reforms, like the vote notably, setting up kindergartens, um, writing songs for ch Australian children, that never would have happened because all the power brokers were male. She had to convince them by logic, reasoning, uh, and her powers of persuasion, not by feminine wiles. There's the petition signed in her name for womanhood suffrage. I think that is so historic. There's her signature there. This was a huge breakthrough historically, finding this document. Enormous breakthrough for women's history. It's now in all the histories.
So she's on the record for this. This was the one that she submitted to the 1897 Federal Convention. You can see it there. We didn't know that women had worked for Federation, so my work, you know, was really important here. There's another, there's one of her womanhood suffrage documents that was published, and that was owned by David Scott Mitchell. So that's Mitchell's signature. In order to understand a, a bit about Maybank's mind and why she has never bored me in all the years I've been researching and looking for her, looking for material relating to Maybank, it really needs her words to give the full impact. She never, although she was of the Victorian era, she didn't ever use flowery language or lots of adjectives when one would do. Her language is pared down and very modern and she didn't pull any punches. Uh, and I'll read some of the statements that she made through her long life, her long public life, and I th over a variety of topics. And I think you'll see what I mean. The first one is about religion. Maybank, we don't know what faith she was, uh, if any, but this is what she believed about religion. Religion is doing what you can for the welfare of humanity and developing your own spiritual life. That is my religion. About the church, she said, woman's position in the church has become one of the questions of the day. And remember, this is in the 1890s. In our last issue of Woman's Voice, we drew attention to the fact that the General Synod of the Anglican Church of New Zealand had thrown out Sir John Hall's bill to confer the ecclesiastical franchise on women, thereby practically declaring that the status of women in the church must be one of inferiority Comma, a declaration somewhat inconsistent with the fact that the church is largely supported by and certainly mainly attended by women. Now how relevant is that for the Jensens and for the Pells of this world who can insist on seeing women as uh, flower, uh, flower gatherers and putting of flowers in churches and forming, performing subsidiary roles and not as full equals in the Church of God. Maybank was writing that and aware of it in the 1890s. And it's still relevant, unfortunately, though many, many women uh, have striven to change it. Overall, I've spent 10 years of my life on Maybank. I mean, done other things, of course, but done teaching in bits and pieces. But overall, I reckon I've given her 10 years of, my, of the best 10 years of my life, and I've loved every minute of it. This is my second major history project, on, which is on women and children, and I did this on Papua New Guinea. It's called Voices from a Lost World, Australian Women and Children in New Guinea Before the Japanese Invasion. And I wrote this book as my doctorate. It was a sequel to writing Maybank. Uh, I'd learnt a lot of history research skills and writing skills from doing the book on Maybank Anderson. And my mother and father lived in New Guinea before the war. So I grew up with all these male stories. My father was a wonderful raconteur and he would hold the floor while he was young and very vital and he would tell all about his New Guinea and my mother would just prepare food because she'd heard all the stories before. So after my father died and my mother was getting a little bit older, I decided that I'd ask her about what it was like being a woman in New Guinea. And then this opened a whole new arena for me. I knew that I'd been conceived in New Guinea, so I felt and we'd grown up with crocodiles and turtle shells and all the memorabilia and, and spears and all the bits and pieces that New Guinea connected families have in their houses. But I'd never actually heard my mother talk about New Guinea and at first she was very reticent as women always are and a bit embarrassed to be interviewed by her daughter and didn't especially want to talk about things like contraception and health matters, women's health matters, because she was too embarrassed about that sort of thing. But gradually she got herself into um, the mode of uh, 
of talking about herself because like many women in that generation she never talked about herself she never thought she was important enough so I started with my mother in the kitchen and and we really developed a whole new layer of friendship of women's friendship there then I moved to my mother-in-law because she had also lived in New Guinea before the war and my husband was actually born there during a tidal wave while his mother, my mother-in-law, had malaria. So I knew there were some good stories there. My mother-in-law also naturally didn't want to talk about contraception or any of the women's health matters, but we made a whole new relationship too by me talking about her New Guinea and her there with two small children and being evacuated and her story was completely different. And I realised that there was this whole minefield of women who never told their stories. I was always confident I'd find a publisher and yet getting women's stories, especially connected with New Guinea, everyone said you'll never do it. And through a women's, women's network, I found uh, an agent very quickly after my doctorate was finished and my doctorate was rewritten um, a little bit so that it was suitable for, for a non-fiction book and was going to appeal to people. So some of the more academic overlay was stripped off and uh, a publisher was found within a, a couple of months of my doctorate being granted. And then the book came out and uh, nobody could have been more pleased than the women I interviewed who just never thought that it would happen. Um, but it did and we're just so thrilled with the result and the book has sold thousands and thousands of copies and gone all over the world. It's been a great deal of interest in it. I thought it was going to be translated into German because as some of you may know uh, Germany had a big involvement in New Guinea before 1914 and some of the homes including the ones that my parents lived in and my parents-in-law lived in were actually built by the Germans. They left a very strong infrastructure when the Australians kicked them out in 1914. It was the first Australian engagement of World War I, was actually in New Guinea, and Australia took over uh, the whole German mandate and were given it after World War I to administer as a territory of Australia. There's a lot of very interesting political history as well as women's history in it, and there are many, many funny stories. With my own mother-in-law, for instance, just, just to finish on, on a personal note, and how history can be misleading and you've got to check and double check. Uh, my mother-in-law was a very keen bridge player and I asked her if she ever played bridge in New Guinea. Oh no dear, she said, no I was much too busy with the boys, meaning her two sons, and I believed her. Uh, and then when I was going through the Rabaul Times and I went through every single edition of that fascinating newspaper, I'd see when my husband was three months old Mrs. Norma Roberts won the bridge tournament again the next week in the Rabaul Times and Mrs. Norma Roberts as usual has won the bridge tournament and I thought yes I'm sure it wasn't deliberately misleading in her own mind she had given up bridge but in reality she was playing every week and the boys were being looked after by their very caring black nurses and nursemaids and often they were they were males they were boys they were core boys and they were young men so it made me aware that i had to double check every single story that people told me because these events had happened many years ago and they'd given them their own twist and gloss uh, as I say, not malicious lying, but made me very careful and I double-checked.